This very tall, very attractive man came over and very warmly gave me a kiss on the cheek. He swept me off my feet. He was very, very intense. I was totally in love with him, and so I trusted him. There was something going on in the background. Danger's everywhere, hun. He had systematically brainwashed me. He was asking us for money. I don't have anything to give. I was under his control. I'm terrified. Living, breathing fear. I was working as business advisor for the Scottish Enterprise Network, having the time of my life. I think we need to lower the price points, and that's really going to increase the sales. I'm very bouncy, very cheerful, see the positive in most things, very optimistic. Mary Turner Thompson runs a thriving consultancy business in her hometown, Edinburgh. She's strong and successful and leads a full life. But there's one thing missing. I had a small child. The relationship with my eldest daughter's father had not worked out. Yeah, you see that? She was a very gregarious woman who's at home with a baby, lovely as that is. So um, I think she just went online just to speak to people. I'd met three guys initially. Uh, the first one turned out to be a bit like a big brother. The second one came across like the mad axe murderer. And the third one was just after a new social life. I just thought, that's it, I don't want to have anything more to do with it. Unbeknownst to me, they keep the profiles on the system. So it was about six months later that I actually got the email from Will Jordan. He told me all about the fact that he was American and he came from New Jersey. He works as an IT consultant in the UK. He seems just perfect. I share your view and personal responsibility. I might as well say at the outset that I'm seeking a long-term relationship, so a quick fun seeker would not find me desirable. He seems at first so genuine and so relaxed. We were emailing five, six times a day, and it's very exciting. He um, appealed to her senses, so he would say that he liked the same things as she did. He seemed to sort of tick all of the boxes for her. He seemed too good to be true. She did feel that she'd met her soulmate. She was probably not expecting to meet somebody, certainly not somebody who seems as perfect uh, as Will Jordan. Right from the start, Will tells her about his personal life. He told me that he was infertile because of a bout of mumps when he was a child. So if growing your family naturally is on your cards, then I suppose I am not the best choice of partners. Though I do want children very much and I get on very well with them. I gave him my number about two weeks into talking to him on email and he promised he was gonna call within the hour. And I waited and I waited and I waited and no call came. And as the hours went by, I started to worry that something had happened and I was really very concerned for him. Two days later, I got an email from him saying that he'd been called away to Spain. I was very angry and very upset. Mary is not impressed, but Will's so apologetic and so persuasive that she ends up agreeing to meet him. We organized to have lunch at a central location in Edinburgh. This very tall, very attractive, man, very tall, dark and handsome, as they say. Came over and very warmly gave me a kiss on the cheek. And I was instantly attracted to him. Put his hand on my small on my back and off we went to the restaurant. 
we're ordering pizza. I order a pepperoni pizza and he goes, that's my favorite too. Whilst we're eating, I'm just looking at each other, thinking, how, how did we manage to have such a strong connection over the written word? I felt totally at ease. The more I found out about him, the more I liked him, admired him, and thought this is actually really quite a special guy. We're walking back to his office, and as we were at the car park, he kisses me. It was a very passionate kiss. Quite often when you have a first kiss, it's a little bit tentative, but uh, his wasn't at all. She phoned me up and was just bubbling over. She was just so happy she'd met this amazing chap who couldn't have children, so was delighted that she already had a daughter. He sent me a dozen roses to my work. It is very exciting. We just seem to be totally in sync. In the first months of knowing Will, I was very happy. I was uh, falling in love with him. This was somebody quite remarkable. We made love. He was very, very intense, very focused. He swept me off my feet. Early in their relationship, Mary invited Will Jordan to meet the family. I'd really like for you to meet my parents. This was an important moment. She wanted her family to meet this person that she's been talking about all this time. Smitten, Mary's keen to introduce Will to her family. The first time that he was supposed to meet my parents, I arrived and he was going to arrive separately. To Mary's intense embarrassment, Will doesn't turn up. The family sit and wait while the food goes cold. And as time ticks by, the sinking feeling of being let down in front of your parents is sickening. As Christmas approaches, Mary is beginning to have serious doubts about her new boyfriend. Against her better judgment, he persuades her to give him one last chance. We were gonna fly down to London go to a weekend black tie do Christmas party, which was very exciting. Will says he's going to pick her up and take her to the airport for the flight to London. As it got closer and closer to the time, I'm getting more and more stressed out. And I text him and I say, are you ready? And I could text back saying, yes, I'm on my way. I'm in the car now. I'm stuck in traffic. And then text back, where are you now? We're going to be late for the plane. Nothing. Where are you? Nothing. So that's when I opened a bottle of wine and I had a couple of glasses of wine when I realized it just wasn't happening. I am absolutely crushed. I sat there thinking, that's it, it's enough. I've been let down too badly. That's it, game over. Didn't hear from him again until the morning. I don't think I even said anything to him. Went into the kitchen and just leaned against the cooker with my arms crossed and my legs crossed, waiting for some sort of explanation. I was angry. I was really, really angry. I was going, this is just not good enough and I'm not going to put up with this. And I'm finishing the relationship. And he says, well, I'm really disappointed we're not going to London because I had a very specific reason to do so. And he said, I wanted to give you this. And he handed me a fluffy teddy with a ribbon around its neck. I had to uncross my arms to take the bear and realized that on the collar of the bear on the ribbon is a ring. His proposal came right out of left field and I was completely taken aback. 
Mary is thrown off guard. The ring's a huge surprise. But that's nothing compared to the terrifying secret her boyfriend is about to reveal. Just four weeks into their relationship, Will Jordan proposes to Mary Thompson. She agrees to think about it. I had only known the man for a month or two, and there was no way I would marry somebody I had only known for that short space of time. He says that he loves her, he wants to be with her for the rest of her life. So she forgives him. I mean, everybody wants to be married. He persuaded me to wear the ring until I changed my mind. That ring effectively told everyone that he may not show up to meet my friends, but he does want me for life. That year I spent Christmas as usual with my family. Very loving and very supportive, but they do tease. They decided that they'd come up with a new nickname for Will, and that was Won't. They thought this was very funny that I was wearing the ring, but that he wasn't there again. My parents obviously thought he was not necessarily good boyfriend material. You know, he, he wasn't reliable. Uh, he wasn't responsible. And there was me having to stick up for him and trying to say, well, no, he's got a lot of work on and, you know, he does his best, but, you know, he does have a lot of work and he's got a lot of commitments that sometimes take priority. And, uh, but it's very hard having to stick up for somebody when you're just as angry with them as your parents are, but you still have to stick up for them. Every day, all day, I would get texts. You know, we would text back and forth 20 to 30 times a day. He would email me lovely letters telling me how much he was missing me. He would say that he was actually frightened by the depth of the emotion he felt for me. And it was very romantic. It made me feel that I was able to uh, let loose my emotions and actually fall in love with him too. Mary was over the moon. She appeared very, very happy. But Wilf was a bit of a mysterious character in terms of not appearing when he was expected. When I did finally meet Will, he worked very hard to charm me. One of the things that Mary had raved about him was that he spoke Japanese and I was living out in Japan. I asked him a very, very simple question in Japanese. Which, even if he'd only spoken quite basic Japanese, he should have been able to understand. Before any answer came back, the high chair suddenly fell over. So of course everybody jumped up and everyone was immediately distracted by that. The Japanese question was just completely forgotten. I think he tipped the high chair over to deflect from the situation. He knew that he was being tested. It isn't just Mary's family who start harboring doubts about Will. She's growing suspicious too. He kept changing his phone numbers. It didn't seem to make a huge lot of sense and I started to have doubts. Something didn't feel right about the reasons he was giving me for the things he was doing. Mary turns private detective. I decided to do some investigating of my own. He'd created a personal website for me, and I had a look at the background, and it listed what his company was. The managing director for this company was somebody called Michelle. Will was actually listed as company secretary, and the address for him was 40 miles south of Edinburgh. How come Will had never mentioned anything about this to Mary? I decided I had to go and see this address. Although it was kind of with a sense of dread, I got in the car and I drove there because I, I had to know. I had to know one way or the other what was really going on. Mary is totally unprepared for what she finds at Will Jordan's company headquarters. I looked over the gate and there were children's toys in the garden. And I was stunned and really, really taken aback. 
There was all sorts of things going through my mind. Is my whole life about to fall apart? Is it cheating on me? Although that's the rational thought, ha, he's married, he's got children. It just didn't fit with who he was. Because the one thing I was absolutely 100% sure about was that Will Jordan was infertile. I was feeling devastated. I was drove home. Nothing I knew about him could be correct. Is he who he says he is? Mary's whole world has been capsized. As soon as I got home, I texted him to say, we need to talk now. I want to look into his eyes and see what he was going to say. I wanted an explanation. He said, please, just hear me out. Just, just hear me out until you make it, you know, until everything's said, and then you can make up your mind. He said, I'll be back in a moment. And he went out the room. And he was in the hallway, on the phone, pacing backwards and forwards. My mobile phone sitting beside me started beeping with texts that said, SIM update, an MOD relay, an ODCI relay. I was very confused. This is not what I was expecting. And he came back through, looked into my eyes and said, I've been given permission to tell you. And I was thinking, OK, this is interesting. Where is this going? What Will reveals is the last thing Mary is expecting. I work for the CIA, babe. He explained to me that he worked for the Central Intelligence Agency. He described it as ODCI, the official department of Central Intelligence. The updates from the ODCI and the MOD relay were to, to make sure that they could access me at any time. My phone would have to be updated and bugged, basically. He was on secondment from the ODCI to the Ministry of Defense. His specialist area was Israel and the Palestinian territories, dealing with insurgents and dealing with unsavories and helping protect others. I didn't disbelieve him because why would he be telling me this unless it was true? Will also tells her that the house she found is actually a CIA safe house. And obviously it had children's equipment in the garden because that made it look innocuous as something that other people wouldn't notice. Mary finds it hard to believe. But Will is so persuasive and so eloquent, and she's so much in love with him, she gives him the benefit of the doubt. He actually cried and told me that I was the one thing that made life worth living, that he couldn't believe how close he'd come to losing me. He now knew why he was doing what he was doing, keeping the world safe because of me and my daughter. I felt very proud of him. After Will Jordan reveals this big, dark truth that he actually works for the CIA, it all seemed to add up, and it seemed to be proof that what he was telling her was the truth. I was totally in love with him, and so I trusted him. He had money packets that were sealed plastic envelopes with the Ministry of Defense stamped on them. He used to carry a gun around. He'd never let me see the gun, but I could certainly feel it under his jacket and I saw the holster. Will claims that her discovery of the safe house has put him under pressure. It means he'll be away for longer periods. He'd had to now shut down that safe house because it was now exposed, and all the team had had to move down south. So it meant that he wasn't able to be so often up in Edinburgh. And I felt quite guilty about it because it made life very difficult for him. Will tells Mary that life for her will be very different now. He explained to me that I would be under surveillance and that I would have to be very careful. And I would have to be able to keep this secret. He told her that the house was bugged, the phone was bugged, she was under surveillance, that somebody was following her all the time. I mean, she was scared to death. I was so isolated from everybody, feeling desperately lonely. 
but nothing prepared me for the shock that was coming. To her amazement, Mary finds out she's pregnant. How can I be pregnant by a man who's infertile? I was completely convinced that Will would think I'd had an affair. And I thought long and hard about how I was going to deal with this. I was very, very worried telling him. But his reaction was extraordinary. He, he leaned against the wall. All the blood drained from his face. He went ashen white and looked at me and said, you're magical. Wow. Wow. The family. We will. Oh my God. It's amazing. It's a miracle. Beautiful. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> when Mary got pregnant, she was thrilled. Here she was able to give the man that she loved what he always wanted and thought that he would never be able to have. It made me feel that this was something that I was able to give him that nobody else would ever have ever managed to do. The child was very special. We were having a, a walk with the family. He drew me aside and asked formally for my permission to marry Mary. I was quite impressed by it, and I said yes. We'd booked Dundas Castle. I'd got myself a beautiful white dress with a veil, and everything was planned. The invitations had gone out, and it was going to be an absolutely wonderful wedding. I did genuinely feel that this was a, a turning point. But Will contacted me and said, actually, there was a problem. He was going to have to go abroad, and we were going to have to postpone the wedding. I was devastated. Once again, Will shatters Mary's happiness. But he says it's not his fault. He claims he's being sent on a top secret mission. He was in the Palestinian territories. He was supposed to only be there for 24 hours, but he got trapped. He was living for three months in rubble. He sent me the images of bulldozed buildings children lying dead in the street. Images of the devastation that was around him. This made her feel like her man was a hero. And probably also made her feel that she had no right to complain. Look at what he was doing. He's out there saving the world. When he was getting access to the satellite, it was usually in the middle of the night. So I was very sleep deprived as well. Dangers everywhere, honey. Right now we're pinned down and we can't move. I was worried that he would never come home at all. And even if he, if he did come home, he was going to be scarred by this. Hello? Hello? She was stuck at home. She was constantly on edge, wondering what was happening to him. Everything she had was invested in him and their relationship. I felt so incredibly frustrated in not being able to say, I know where he is, I know what he's doing, and I can't tell you. Something very odd was going on here. I was beginning to wonder if Will was actually just some kind of Walter Mitty character. It was desperately lonely. Not only did I not have him by my side, but I also couldn't talk to my family. I was totally isolated. Will has forbidden Mary from telling anyone about his top secret CIA work. If she does, she'll put them all in danger. But in desperation, she confides in her closest friend. When she told me that Will worked for the CIA, it didn't seem quite believable, but she was absolutely sure. She believed in him and that what he was doing was good. Mary's baby is due any day now, but there's no sign of Will. I felt frustrated by the fact he just didn't seem to care. I texted to tell him that I'd gone into labor and didn't get a reply. But even Will's absence can't spoil the happiness she feels when her baby comes into the world. This lovely little girl with blue eyes and black curly hair was born safely and, and healthy. 
I fell in love with her from the moment I saw her, and she was absolutely beautiful. Will wasn't there. I felt, you know, well, Superman's off saving the world. People's lives are being saved. How can I complain about being stood up, even for the birth of our child, if he's going through such horrors? After almost six months marooned in Palestine, Mary's fiance finally reappears at the family home. He was very thin, very pale, very ill. He looked almost half the man he had been. He lay down in the bed with, with our daughter and the baby and just looked at her and just looked at her for hours, just was so in awe of the fact that he was now a father. But mentally and emotionally, he seemed like a, he really had lost faith in the service. He'd lost faith in what he was doing. He wanted out. Will tells Mary he wants to leave the CIA. The trouble is, they're reluctant to let him go. I believe that they were actually punishing him, that they were making life difficult for him, as an example to other people, that you don't leave. The CIA were asking us for money to effectively buy him out of the service. He thinks that if he's able to extricate himself from the CIA, then he could come home to her and their children and they could be a family. At that point, I was starting to really not trust what he was saying. Just there were so many inconsistencies. You know, why would he have to pay his way out of the CIA? I just felt there's no other option that I had to give him the money. I was under his control. Mary hands over $20,000 of her savings. It's a price worth paying. Now he can start his new life with her. And I just felt finally things were going to change. Finally, we were going to be together as a family. It was a very happy time for me. You now he was alive and safe and well, and I didn't have to worry about his, him being in danger. My mum was the one who always looked after us and stuff, who fed us, dressed us, got us clothes, looked after us. And like Will and my dad, they were just, you know, the kind of thing on the side. They were like the fun people that would come and say hello to us every once in a while kind of thing. Will was always like the super dad. He was always like really strong, helping her with the dishes, helping with cooking, helping putting us to bed. Always giving us piggybacks and, you know, lifting up in the air. So we decided that we were going to get married again. With the last of her savings, Mary organises a last-minute wedding. I rang my parents and my sisters and my brother and I said, I'm, I'm getting married today if you want to come down. They got married in a registry office. We had a party that evening for them in our house, and it all went very well. We decided to try for another baby. So in the, the summer of 2004, I fell pregnant again. When they did finally get married, I think I was kind of relieved for Mary because I knew that it was what she wanted, but I was also sort of quite concerned. I could see that he wasn't making her happy. Despite buying her husband out of the CIA, Mary has to give Will Jordan more money. He asked me for money for his mother because she was ill in hospital and to pay the medical bills. So I'd remortgaged the flat and raised uh, seven and a half thousand pounds. His mom's medical bills are small change compared to Will's next demands. He got a contract working for a software company down in Cambridge. He was away a lot of the time, but it was whilst he was working for the software company that his old life in the CIA came back to haunt us. Life was spiraling badly out of control. Despite leaving the intelligence service, Will tells Mary he's being blackmailed by an enemy agent. Will said that if he didn't come up with money, that we would have bits ripped off us and sent to him through the post. 
how better to hurt him than, than through his wife and his children. I dream about people breaking into the house. I'm terrified, absolutely terrified, and I can't tell anyone. Will tells Mary there's only one way out. He's already given all his money to the agent blackmailing him. Now it's her turn. I had to come up with money. Otherwise, my worst nightmare would come true. Mary Thompson believes her family is being blackmailed by enemy agents who are after her husband. Will Jordan says their only way out is to pay them off. Initially, he asked for 10,000 pounds. I thought that was going to be it. But there was more money required. 5,000 here, 10,000 there. I didn't know what he was up to, but it didn't feel it didn't see, feel as if it was a straight story. Is all this, un, you know, unbelievable? But she was in denial about it. As long as he gets the money that he needs to pay these people off, they will be kept away from us. It was something very scary and far bigger than me. I was pregnant, so I did feel very vulnerable when he wasn't around. Will tries to reassure her. He gave me a taser and taught me how to use it so that I would be able to defend the children. I held the taser in my hand, unsure whether I could hurt another human being. This reinforced the idea that she was in danger, and it, it also added to the sense of paranoia that she felt and the sense of isolation. And I can't tell you the amount of times that I got up in the middle of the night having heard a noise and would go down the stairs carrying that taser. I mean, it's just living, breathing fear. Very quickly, any money that we had in the bank was gone. Very quickly, I had to raise more money. I remortgaged the flat. That money was gone. In desperation, Mary turns to her brother. I'm going to need 5,000 pounds. Mary asked for another 5,000, at which point I turned around to her and said, is this for you or is this for Will? And she said, it's for Will. And I said, in that case, I'm not willing to give it to you. I was suspicious of, of Will. I got to the stage where I thought this, this had gone on too far. Eventually, the only real option to raise enough money to, to get these people off our backs was to sell the flat. I sold my flat in Portobello and raised £165,000. Almost all of it went to these very dangerous people who were threatening our lives. She thinks if they can just get over this hurdle, then everything is going to be wonderful. With Will away looking for more contract work, Mary rents a cheap apartment. I was not rational, and I really was trapped. I was so short of money, I was scrabbling around the back of couches trying to find change to buy some milk for the children. Within a couple of weeks, Will came back and said, I need more, and this is really, really important, and this is vital, and this is the last ever. And I, I just shook my head and I said, I haven't got it. This would be the last time, I promise you. I had pretty much given the shirt off my back. I had no money. I had nothing else I could sell. If I was going to get hurt, then I was going to get hurt. That was it. We'd reached the bottom of the bucket, and there was no further down to go. I was pregnant and alone, but I just had to just keep going. She was a very together person when she met Will, and that slowly sort of disintegrated. And she did become pretty much a shell of the person she used to be. Zach was born, and I did genuinely believe that things were about to get better. And one day I receive a phone message from Will that makes my blood run cold. My very worst nightmare is coming true. I'd missed a phone call from Will, and uh, it had gone on to answer machine. And he'd called me by mistake. 
There was a woman saying, sit down in the back, and then you could hear Will aggressively saying, put your seatbelt on. I'd never heard him use that tone. It sounded exactly like a husband and wife being irritable with their children. I listened to it over and over and over and over again, trying to glean some sort of information from it. All of Mary's worst fears about Will are coming back to haunt her. I called Will, said, we need to talk. I was very angry and very upset. When he came home, he explained to me that there was more than one man in the car, that there was a CIA man at the back of the car loading up equipment, that the children were calling daddy. Surely I had heard him talking as well. And I said, no. There is this possibility that my husband has another family. But if that's the case, then he's lied to me from the very beginning. It's something that my brain can't even process. I have to believe him. Her whole life had been built around supporting this man. So to see information that said everything she had been working for was a lie was just very, very difficult to take in. And yet again, Mary gives Will the benefit of the doubt until the police call. In December, I got a phone call from the police to say, where's your car? And I said, it's my husband's driving it in England. And they said, thank you very much, and hung up. And I thought, that was weird. And then I got a phone call from Will afterwards, absolutely furious. And he was shouting at me saying, you don't know what you've done, you don't know what you've done. You've been arrested and charged with fraud. In addition, the police have found a wedding certificate in his car. He's married to someone else. And therefore, they charged him with bigamy. I was devastated. The woman Will's married to is Michelle, the supposed CIA spy who was living in the safe house that Mary tracked down early in their relationship. I was very conflicted and very confused. He said, I wasn't to say anything. I was not to answer any questions because they were going to try and trip me up. So when the police rang me and said that he'd been charged with bigamy, I kept quiet. I was scared to remember any evidence that I'd ever known anything about Michelle. So, under his instruction, I shredded the details I had, the company house records I had, showing that Michelle was the company director. I took any receipts and I shredded them and I burnt them in the grate. And I took the ashes. And as instructed to Will, I walked down the street to check I wasn't followed and then put them in somebody else's bin. Any remaining illusions Mary has about Will are finally shattered when Michelle reaches out to her. The phone rang. I heard the female voice on the phone saying, hello, is that Mrs. Jordan? And I said, yes. And the voice said, I'm the other Mrs. Jordan. So finally, after six years, two children, $300,000 in debt, humiliated and broken spirited, I have to face the truth. My husband does have another family. I came across Mary's number. It was on his phone. I had the number two years before I had the courage to call it. I could hear the panic in Mary's voice. I just did what I felt was instinct, which was to just get in the car and go to her. I rang my good friend Karina and said, I need to talk. Mary had had a phone call from Michelle, who was Will's other wife, and she was going to come up on that day, um, which would be for the first time, you know, that they would have met each other. We sat down and I told her everything from the very beginning. I told her the whole story. I unburdened myself from all this trauma and pain that I'd been through and how much I had trapped it inside. 
and it was difficult and embarrassing and hard and emotional. Everything's going to be okay. She was brilliant. She sat, she listened to me, and she didn't judge. She was very supportive. Mary had only just found out about this woman, so I wanted to be in the house when she arrived. Finally, the two Mrs. Jordans come face to face. There was no denying this evidence in front of me. She showed me the wedding certificate. She showed me passports. She showed me document after document. I was curious as to the life that they lived and had lived. I felt compelled to look around to see how much of him was there. It was a very strange experience because she walked around the house saying, oh, I've got one of those. Oh, we've got that. Is that Will's? I've got one of those. He'd kept a lot of things consistent between their lives. So you could see Mary's life disintegrating as this other woman walked around the apartment. Sorry. <laughs> we sat and cried through the night, and I felt sad for Mary because she'd been duped. Mary is still struggling to come to terms with the reality. It didn't make any sense that this person who seemed so genuine and charismatic and charming and confident set me up so callously from the very beginning. He had systematically brainwashed and stressed me to the point that I was totally under his control. Shortly after Michelle left, I sat down on the bed and I texted Will and ended the relationship. Mary thinks she's broken free of Will Jordan, but the nightmare continues. And though I can't see how the situation can get worse, it does. Not only is Will Jordan a fraudster and bigamist, now she discovers he's a sex offender. Police tell her that, four years before he met Mary, he was convicted in England of sexually molesting a girl under the age of 13. When the police said all these things, I just didn't say anything. But they did say to me that I would have to speak to social worker because my husband was a known paedophile. Astonishingly, Will still believes he can pull the wool over Mary's eyes. He calls her to offer his own fantastical version of events. Hey, babe. Hey, what's up? Listen to me, babe. Ten years ago, I did a job at a sex offender's prison. They had a 13-year-old girl say that I molested her just so I can get into the prison so I can do the job. After six years of lies and excuses, Mary's finally forced to face the truth. That was the lowest point in my life. In desperation, she goes to see a lawyer. And the lawyer said, I've heard it all before. I've heard every excuse that every, any guy can come up with. What you're telling me is true? He said he was a known paedophile, a systematic and controlling con man. I never thought that he would do this. He would think about hurting my children. As the social services say, you do something, you do it to keep your children. I left the lawyer's office and I sat in the car and I just cried because I knew I wouldn't allow somebody to take my children away because they believed him to be a paedophile. Will Jordan never did abuse Mary's children. His trial for fraud and bigamy opens in November 2006, six years after their first date. I had spoken to the police and said, I want my statement in front of the judge. I wrote that this man, he had systematically targeted and impregnated single mothers to rip them off for money. I was very nervous about seeing him in court. My doctor had said to me, don't look it in his eyes, look at his shoulder. So he then doesn't have any control over you. People believe that sociopaths hypnotize their targets with the predatory stare. So she was very careful not to look at him. He knew exactly what he was doing. The judge said that Will Jordan was an inveterate exploiter of vulnerable women. The statement that I gave the judge made all the difference. Because he got five years. 
He got 18 months for the bigamy. He got 18 months for the fraud. He got nine months for not registering address under the Sex Offenders Act. Well, Jordan just looked nonchalant, not bothered, not guilty. He didn't look like the man I'd married. Finally, I looked at him straight in the face. His eyes went up a bit of that kind of, oh, I've got her kind of thing. And I just turned away. I've never felt any need for revenge or anything like that, but it felt good to say, I've got the power back. It's mine, not yours. You don't have any control over me anymore. Will Jordan serves part of his sentence in a British prison. In 2009, he's released and deported to the United States. When Will Jordan came back to New Jersey, he just went right back to the same pattern. He took out an ad on Match.com and started looking for another single mother who he could target. Mary now helps other women deal with manipulative predators like her former husband. In early 2014, out of the blue, she gets a call from New Jersey. My name is Michelle. I am engaged to who I thought was Liam Allen, who turned out to be William Allen Jordan, and not at all who I thought he was meant to be. He happened to have left his wallet behind, and something told me, look in it. And so I did, and I had seen a immigration and naturalization card, and it had the name listed as William Allen Jordan. I said, you know what, Google this name. And when I did, a whole plethora of things had come up, the articles, the news reports. I am currently nearly 10 weeks pregnant with his child upon finding that he is a, a bigamist, a pedophile, and a scam artist. I finally now accept the truth that Will Jordan is a sociopath and that his only pleasure in life is manipulating other people. Mary's a strong woman. She's moving on with her life. She's taking care of her kids. And she's also speaking out about what has happened to her. And I applaud her for doing that. He took four years to get me to the point where I was malleable enough to rip me off for money. It's a long con. <laughs> 